I'm assuming that if you're here, you're probably here to uh, listen primarily to Barbara Rose, who's an extremely distinguished art historian and critic, uh, spends most of her time in the jury. But uh, we'll be talking about Dal Hell. Um, tell me about your relationship with him. Tell us about your relationship. Well, I met Al uh, probably was about 19 years old, and uh, he he was just, you know, this unbelievably dynamic, uh, charismatic, I would say, person. And uh, at that time, he was uh, still looking like, uh, you know, a movie star, which he, he was very good looking. I'm sure his daughter would uh, agree when he was young. Uh, and he had this very, very high energy level. And he was just an impressive guy. And he was painting, at that time, these very large paintings, which were wall size. And they were absolutely flat. Uh, and I think, you know, his evolution as an artist, which I, I followed very closely because I've always liked his work. He's always been one of my favorite artists. Um, it was how to deal with, you know, this Greenbergian, it's got to be flat to be modern. Uh, and I think he was able to reconcile, you know, the issue of flatness of modern art with a kind of illusionism that didn't contradict that flatness, or that had so many contradictions that in the end they were all resolved in a, in a sense that this is the picture plane. Nice. Do you think that he's, um, th so this show is up uh, now, uh, uh, late works. This is a, it was just an early works show. I mean, do you feel like he's having a moment of some sort? Is it? Uh... I think he's gonna have a moment forever. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a real fan. Um, I wrote, I, when he first started doing the black and white paintings, which also you know, had this high degree of illusionism, except that the forms were transparent, they weren't solid. Yeah. So even though they were perspective projections, they didn't create any real space. Just as I don't think that even there there is a spatial construction, these paintings don't create anything that we would um, associate with the illusionistic space of, let's say, you know, earlier art. Um, but but uh, uh, I think, I, no, I think uh, Al is a great artist, period. And uh, oh, so this article I wrote for New York Magazine, and I, um, the title was The Long Distance Runner, because Al had a great capacity to um, alienate people. He's really good at that. Uh, <laughs> you know, he would always do something that was like, it was just not what the market wanted, or, you know, the paintings were too big, or, and he, I think that was part of his uh, dialectic spirit. It was like if, if the market wanted something, he managed to do the other thing. But, he, but as I say, he was a great painter, and, and you see an evolution. It's consistent. There's a single person who is dealing with uh, a set of problems that he's basically setting out for himself. And I think it's important to realize that, you know, he was of the age of the Greenberg uh, Stay in color field paintings of Frankenthal and Lewis Nolan and on and on and on, and he didn't go for that. Uh, and he was really marginalized by Clem Greenberg, who thoroughly detested him, uh, because Al was just—he was not going to get in line. He was not going to—he was not going to be with the program. No serial painting, uh, no doing what Clem wanted, um, no this palette that was so predictable. I mean, when you look at these colors, uh, he made them all up. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's unbelievable. He's, you know, uh, you begin in art school with Chevrolet, you know, with the color wheel, or, and then you get to Hoffman, you get push-pull of the uh, cold and hot colors. But here, it, it, it's, it's an extended palette. Some of it, I think, coming from um, a mannerist painting. I mean, if you think about Pontormo, uh, you can see that there's a, and very late, Michelangelo, and oh, late geez. Raphael. Yeah, it's, it's a different, attitude toward color. So he wasn't really a, was, was, the, was the conflict with Greenberg that he wasn't really a theorist, that he, I mean, that, that he wasn't interested in intellectualizing what he was doing too, or, or was it that he um, just wouldn't get with the program as it? There was not one single person in the circle of Clement Greenberg who ever had an idea. The ideas, uh, such as they were, were all Clem's. Uh, and uh, Al just, no, he was not with the program. Um, and he, uh, I, he, I think he felt that that painting was uh, oversimplified, shallow, and that, uh, and I tend to agree, uh, and that, that he didn't want to just make a whole series of paintings. I mean, Greenberg would walk into a studio and he'd say, see that one? Make a hundred like that. 
And that's not what Al was going to do. I mean, each, pro, each uh, painting, each work was a struggle. It was about a struggle. And in that sense, I was thinking about, you know, well, who's he really like? And I, I think that really after coming through, you know, the New York school and the push-pull idea and then the flatness and the walls and the mural and the easel and all that, that the, the artist at the end that he's most like is Cezanne. Yeah, this is, and you, you mentioned this in, uh, in your really wonderful um, essay in the catalog for this, the, this idea that, that he um, gave structure to expressionism as a, or abstract expressionism. Well, he was always, uh, he was not a constructivist per se. You can see there's geometry in these paintings, uh, but there's also perspective. But this perspective keeps canceling itself out. Um, and I was looking at these paintings again and I thought, yeah. where are we? Are we in outer space looking down, or are we looking, I mean, up, or is, uh, none of these structures could be real. Uh, and I was mentioning to Irving Sandler, uh, who knew Al very, very well, um, that Al always started with these kind of surrealist doodles, which a lot of the New York School guys did, to, just before they got the real idea. Um, and there's this imaginary space that, that's that he constructs. It's different from, let's say, Mata's imaginary space. But they have one thing in common. It's outer space. These, these guys, you know, were thinking about things that we're only seeing now. And uh, the other artist that I see this in, strangely enough, is Mata. Interesting. He was somewhat dismissive of, uh, Held was somewhat dismissive of, of surrealism, though, was he not? Oh, yeah, no, no, all the whole New York school. I mean, oh, the surrealists were bad. And, and uh, I remember uh, Sidney Tillum was a painter walked in and he said, uh, the Surrealists had nightmares because they were such bad painters. And no, the New York School was essentially uh, anti-Surrealist. Yeah, they thought that it was backward, it was academic. Uh, but when you think about it, I mean, uh, it's a construction of, uh, it's totally imaginary. I mean, there's no, if you think about it, well, where, where is this, you know? And I think a lot of it has to do with images that we could associate with the projections that scientists are making now. It's, it really is related to kind of outer space. And, and then on the other hand, there are some paintings, and these are all watercolor paintings, and I watched Al paint uh, you know, parts of some of them because I lived in the next village in Italy. We, uh, there was a moment at which a number of us decided that um, we really needed to get away from New York because it was suffocating and it was, um, it was nonsense. And we wanted to think and we wanted to work, and we didn't want to be distracted by, um, I mean, what is now the art world, which is nothing but a, I mean, a giant distraction. Uh, and in this peaceful, quiet, Umbrian, ancient landscape where Al built himself a stone studio, he bought an old farmhouse and restored it, as I had also. And uh, there, you know, there, the tradition goes back to Piero della Francesca, and you could go and actually see the Renaissance painters. I mean, that's where they came from. That's where Raphael uh, spent his uh, youth in studying with Perugino in Perugia. So we had all of this, you know, at our disposal. And we were looking at real art. We weren't looking at slides. We weren't looking at reproductions. And God knows we weren't looking at digital imagery because uh, Al couldn't use a computer. And so all of these ideas that he had really came out of his own head. Was he interested in science at all? I mean, was yeah, yeah. He read. I mean, he read everything basically. He uh, he read books uh, on physics, and I think he was interested in the concept of outer space, genuinely so. And he was interested in new ideas. I mean, but not sort of the novelties of the art world, which he could care less about. Um, and and I think these these constructions, and they are constructions, even though they're not constructivist, they are constructions about you know how we might see outer space. They seem to engage with, with the space of architecture, too, though, um, don't you think? I, and I wonder if he you know, spent much time looking at Palladian architecture in Italy, et cetera. And well, these things actually do look like uh, some of them have uh, architectural uh, feeling about them, yes. Yeah. But that's because they're geometric. And the tile work you would see in, in that part of Italy, I mean, that's... Well, we uh, saw a lot of that stuff, yeah. you know. Um, but I don't think... Uh, you know, that architecture was a major interest of Al's, even though he was the dean of the Yale School of Art and Architecture at a certain point. And, um, I, I'm, I, you know, every time I look at these paintings, I see something else. It's like, uh, if you look at some of them, they have a, a framing element so that 
it, it looks as if you are looking into or up at or down on. It's like it's very, they're very disorienting. But I think that corresponds to our condition. I think we're disoriented. So I think that uh, part of the validity is his ability to, to picture how we feel, you know? Yeah. It, I, I'm interested too in the fact, uh, you, I mean, he, he has this contrary in nature, doesn't want to go with the crowd, and yet they're, they're pleasing paintings. I mean, they're, 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 they're not hard to engage with in a certain sense. I mean, they're... They, you know. I'm glad you don't think so. <laughs> you think people do. <laughs> no, they're extraordinarily complex, and uh, people really don't want to deal with complexity anymore. You know, they want a little cartoon character, or they want a bunny, or a different kind of a bunny, and, you know, this is kind of, I would say, anti-bunny art um, in many ways. <laughs> no, no child's toys, no porno. No porno! I mean, how can you possibly yeah. be interested in this? But I, I agree that's a problem, actually, but... <laughs> <laughs> But you know, we could play, pay some on or something. Um, can we talk a little bit about the, the, the specific ways they, they engage with Italian art? Because you, I mean, I'm looking at at the sort of hard edge um, formal elements I interacting with with uh, with um, with flowing elements with with you know more biomorphic things which is uh, I don't see biomorphism no, I mean, really, I guess, yeah, uh, at all I mean drapery they, or, well you know. I guess you're talking about these kind of snake like forms that look as if they're braided or they're yeah. twisted in and out I, if you look at um, especially uh, Poncharmo uh, you know the Mariner's paintings you'll see this kind of spatial contradiction and you'll see this very uh, enlarged palette often using pastel colors uh, I, I, was, I was surprised. I, I used to see a lot of Al, and I walked in, and he had all of the uh, huge uh, reproductions of images of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. So if you took, for example, a close-up, maybe, of one of Michelangelo's draperies, that might be something that you, you, you know, could associate it with. But also realize that the Renaissance invented, oh well, uh, the Renaissance invented perspective. Um, the Renaissance invented perspective, and he's living in Renaissance land. And so he's seeing, but the kind of perspective he's seeing is not the perspective he is actually doing. He's seeing, you know, the one point perspective of the Renaissance, and he's using multiple <coughs> perspectives, uh, some, of, some of which are, as I say, a lot of it, a lot of the information you're seeing here is contradictory. And balancing out these contradictions was the task that, that he set for himself. Was, was he engaging with earlier work, do you think, at all? And, I mean, oh, or how well, does this relate oh, to Oh, yeah, that? no, we used to talk about old masters all the time, like, I mean. I'm sorry, <laughs> his earlier work. Um, oh, his earlier work. No, I think he really lived in the moment. You know, when he had explored something and that was it. Um, not really. Uh, I think he returned to the um, problem of the wall painting or the mural, the very large painting, as opposed to what uh, we term the easel convention. And these paintings uh, were not painted on easels at all. They were painted on tables, and he's like a monk, and he's like this. Right. Um, but, uh, but, but, but I think he would, um, you know, he dealed with the basic problems of painting, uh, which was space, color, uh, and, um, and how they might fit into um, the white cube or not the white cube. I, th I think this is a, you know, a, for him and the whole New York school, this was a very dif difficult problem to resolve, which was public art versus private art for the collector, the market, that kind of thing. And uh, the New York school painters, by and large, did not want to do easel paintings. They wanted to do, you know, permanent mural paintings, which was what the Renaissance guys were doing. So, you know, they, they wanted that chance, but uh, it didn't happen since we never had uh, the kind of government that would have supported that kind of work, as they did in Mexico, for example. For a time, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, Pollock wanted to paint murals. Yeah, and Held studied with Siqueiros, no? What? Held studied with uh, Siqueiros, did he not? Pollock studied with Siqueiros. I don't know that Al did. I did, he did? I'm, I'm seeing yeah. Irving saying, yes, he did. No, yeah, I don't think so. No, he was he going to. Pollock studied with Siqueiros. Siqueiros was uh, only very briefly. <coughs> what, Mara, are you saying something? See, uh, he was going to. I want to go to the GI Bill, except Siqueiros got in a gunfight. 
and he lost his accreditation with the American government, so Al had to go to Paris instead. Oh, too bad. <laughs> He also, I mean, you know, I guess he's considered second generation New York school. Well, the second generation of the New York school actually were much better painters technically than the first generation because they went to real art schools and they also were formed in Paris. Right. And, you know, after, after that kind of a foundation, then you come back to New York and you see things differently. And although the modern paintings, the great modern paintings were here, um, you know, they were bought by Barr. And if they weren't bought by the Americans, they were bought by the Russians. Actually, uh, what was left in Paris was not wonderful. I mean, we had the good Mondrians here. We had the great Matisses, the great Picassos. And uh, so the school of Paris were really kind of third-rate painters is what they ended up with. And if you look at the collection uh, at the Centre Pompidou, it's, mm, you know, you can't, you can't compare it with the Museum of Modern Art. Why do you think, why, it, uh, let's talk about watercolor for a second and why these are painted. Ah, yeah. ah. There, here I think is something that is very, very important about these paintings because these are not sketches. These are large watercolor paintings. Why use watercolor? Well, the Renaissance masters used, it, used tempera and you get a different kind of light. And what Al wanted to get, and he couldn't get it except in the watercolor where the whiteness of the page will come through, he wanted to have this sense of uh, the illumination coming from within, which was what made Newman such a great painter. Uh, and, and he could get it in watercolor. You couldn't get it, so God said, you couldn't get it in acrylic. I mean, that's for sure. But you could get it in tempera, which is the way the old masters uh, used it, or you could get it in watercolor. Do you because, know I mean, if you look at these, you know, they're full of light. Absolutely. Do you know when approximately you started to use them, uh, use watercolor at one point? Or? I don't really know. I mean, the whole time uh, that he was in Italy in the farmhouse, I know he did, um, certainly for at least 10 years. I mean, maybe Mara, his daughter, knows exactly how long. I think he started doing watercolors when he went to the American Academy. Yeah, it had to do with Italy. Yeah, it had to do with Italy. And what was it? When did he go to? 1981. 1981. So that was a big break in Al's life because all of a sudden, Here's, you know, this American, and, all, and he's sitting in the middle of the Italian Renaissance, and it just changes his, his whole way of thinking that, you know, maybe modern art is shallow. Maybe there's more to it. Maybe it should be more complex, which doesn't mean he was going to give up abstraction, because usually when you have that kind of reaction to, let's say, geometric art or constructivist art or, you know, then you start painting some kind of realism, and that never interested him. Yeah, though, though there's definitely sort of recognizable elements going. I mean, he he he, he sort of, it's not pure abstraction, right? I, it's, well, it's, what do you see? Well, it's, this is rather theatrical, where you have the the framing, as you say, devices, and um, and and uh, I mean, it, you know, elements of building, and and uh, and really. It almost relates to um, to old map making, if you think about yeah. it, to old map making. Uh, possible, possible. I mean, I know he, he went to the Vatican libraries, which are full of them. Um, uh, you know that you're. Uh, I mean, each of these paintings is different, but uh, these the ones in which the frames are enclosing the central image. I do think they look like proscenium. Uh, they do, and then in old master painting, uh, you you have this um, way of composition which uh, you have these framing elements. Um, the the te technical term now uh, escapes me, but, uh, well, coulis, but it wasn't that. It, um, there's a specific technical term for these framing elements yeah. uh, that you see in old master paintings. But, you know, in Italy, um, there wasn't uh, very much interest in any kind of modern art. Uh, so, I mean, if you went to a museum, or if you went anywhere, what you were seeing was old art. You were seeing either classical, you know, Roman art, uh, or you were seeing the Renaissance. Uh, there was so much Renaissance art around in Umbria. I mean, it was just, you know, you go to a church, you go to another church, and, and, and Piero della Francesca, there were so many. Um, so it, it was a, a very different um, <clears throat> mental landscape. Yeah. Shall we open it up and see if there are any questions from? Others too. I feel like there's such. 
Any thoughts? I'll just keep going then. I have actually for one, for one um, which always fascinated me about um, Al's, and I, asked, I actually asked him about it, and for all his illusion, illusionism, there are no cast shadows. There's no? Cast shadows. There's no cast shadow on Oh, cast shadow. There's no cast shadow onto another object. So yeah. that there's self-shadow, that is to say that the, the, the shape contains a shadow. But it's not a shape that's casting a, a, a shadow on another surface. Yeah, that's and right. He, and he, he was like fascinated with it. We kind of talked about that for a while. We were trying to figure out why. Well, and the reason he, written on me, he said, we figured it out. He said, well, it's because they move everything around. And, and, and one of the things that, that people don't really quite get is that he moved like, he was like this giant puzzle maker. Puzzle. That's really an interesting with, word. With 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 lots of different uh, uh, elements. Yeah. yeah. People just paper. He worked with mm -hmm. paper and moved everything around, mm -hmm. and then it gelled into the the, the, the final thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it took these steps to do it. But because of those steps, if if there had been a cash shadow, it couldn't have moved. It. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, really, we associate you know cast shadows with traditional illusionistic painting because you know you would have to believe that it's a solid form that's casting a shadow whereas modern painting <laughs> doesn't allow for that or chiaroscuro or any of the illusionistic devices but Al did use this one illusionistic device that he you know grabbed back from the old masters which is perspective but somehow he used it in a way that he was constantly contradicting it so that in the end you didn't believe you were looking through a window you knew you were looking at a flat space uh, in which all of these contradicting, uh, contradictory elements uh, were uh, displayed. And, and that's the fact that, you know, he was a true dialectic all by himself, I always think. You know, he, he, he was. I mean, Al was a living dialectic. And no matter what you said, he had the opposite, and then, you know, then it would go on and on. But, uh, it, you know, these are, these are very um, push-pull paintings in the sense of tension. Uh, and I remember, um, as only Irving could remember, uh, Harold Rosenberg talking about the crisis content. And the crisis content had to do with how much tension there was in a painting and how difficult it was to resolve these conflicting tensions. And I, I think that uh, why, why we're still interested in these paintings, and they're, they're endlessly interesting, um, is because there is this tension and this, this uh, push and pull conflict. And I don't mean push pull in the Hoffman sense, uh, I mean in a very physical sense. Yeah, they're, they're, they're tense and yet they're not, they're, they're, there is a, a sort of ease or lightness and that has to do with the, the palette and the, uh, and, and the, uh, the, the warmth of the, of the paintings in a certain sense. That, um, you know, that all has to do with, uh, yeah, that has to do with how we lived. I remember we moved, we all moved to the country. It was really the country. There was nobody around except a bunch of farmers. So it, it you didn't have this feeling of the, um, how shall I put it, the rattle of the city. You know, it was, uh, Umbria was an extremely peaceful place at that time. And, and that painting over there, I mean, I am so reminded of the tilled fields in the uh, hills in Umbria. Umbria is a very hilly uh, territory. And uh, there's also an effect, a weird effect that happens in Umbria, uh, which is uh, often there were clouds or mists, especially in the morning. And it looked as if the houses and, and the cows were walking on these clouds. So there, there were these strange, you know, things that happened which uh, caused people to call it Umbria Mystica, mystical Umbria. And uh, I, I think that, you know, it entered into what, what everybody was doing. Um, and of course, uh, at first, when Al first moved to Umbria, Piero Dorazio was still alive. And, and Piero was an extraordinary intellectual. I mean, you could really fight with Piero. Um, and Al was always looking for a, he was, he was looking for a good fight. Was it, is that why he moved to Umbria particularly? I mean... Uh, no, what happened was a number of uh, interesting people. Uh, so we knew each other. So we knew like where there was a farm. I mean, Beverly Pepper was there forever. And Nick Caroni started a school. And, um, you know, we, so there was a kind of, uh, Alighiero Boetti lived there. Um, a number of people, a number of people, not just Americans, but uh, there, there was a kind of community of, of artists who knew each other. And I think, you know, how did Al find out about Umbria? Uh, probably through Beverly Pepper, I don't know. Edward. Really? Edward. Oh my, 
oh, this is a good story, but it's probably so long, I can't, can't put it. Edward Euclid was Al's student. Uh, he was also my student at Yale. And uh, Al uh, flunked him out. Uh, it was his uh, MA thesis, Al said, this is not acceptable. And what Edward did, because he, he was very uh, strange himself, he and an original, he got these flower pots. And then he, I don't know if you remember, dippity do. And he called it Violet Movie Stars. And they were all set up like a Don Judd, except they were little flower pots. And Al just felt that this wasn't giving art its full dimension. Now, if he had a show today, I mean, he'd be up there in the stratosphere of Christie's and they'd be doing God knows what. But anyway, but, but Edward um, remained friendly with Al and me. Uh, and he bought a little piece of land above my house. And he bought it from Bob Hughes, who was also going to move there, but then eventually did not. Um, and I guess, yeah, Edward, uh, who had stayed, who was Al's student, um, probably told him, well, there's some land up there and we're all up there, so why don't you come? Because I think Al, after the residency at the American Academy, which was so important, decided he really wanted to live in Italy. I mean, it was a very different life. With, do you think there's an engagement with Poussin in, in, in any of these, in, in his work? Poussin, the, yeah. Um, I, I mean, it's I a strange that, I mean, thing I, to say. I mean, I personally never yeah. had a conversation with Al about Poussin. Did right. you? Yeah. One thing you did say, Barbara, this contradiction. Al thought that contradiction exemplified the modern condition. He generalized from that yeah, and yes. worked it out in his painting. A absolutely. Uh, that, yes, he did feel that we lived in this very contradictory uh, world, but that we should learn to live with it. Uh, and not deny that it was so complex and contradictory, and that he could make a picture that in which these contradictory uh, movements or uh, interactions or structures could be resolved in the way that, let us say, Cezanne, after you know a little stroke here, a little stroke there, could finally balance out a painting and achieve a kind of equilibrium, which is what he sought. I mean, he wanted uh, finally, out of all of this uh, very contradictory matter, he he sought. Uh, a, a resolution, an equilibrium. And just to be clear, so he's moving pieces of paper around on, on the table? Is this, I mean, is that, no. Is that um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he had these big tables uh, in his studio. But he didn't use paper on them. No, not at the point that he was in Umbria, no. I mean, he, he would have these, which would be, you know, on tables, and he would sit there and he would, after he'd drawn them in, uh, and he did before these, you know, he would think out certain things like I have a very small, it's like a drawing, um, and he's figuring out things. He's just figuring out things. And then eventually, you know, he finds what he wants to do, but it's, it's drawn in and then it's painted. So he drew a lot. He, uh... Yeah, I mean, some of it was just really almost, um, I would say scribbling or doodling, but it was just kind of... Uh, sort of visionary. I mean, for example, a form like that, that's not a, that in no way a geometric form. Uh, it, it's, um, it, it, you know, it has, it has nothing to do with constructivism. It might have something to do with, you know, Borromini or some of those uh, Baroque churches uh, that in Rome, you know, with this uh, curvilinear uh, yeah. possibility. I, I think, yes, the architecture, you see, you know, you see all these great buildings. It has to make an impression on you. Yeah. You'd think so. What else do we need to know? Yes? How do you, how do you think he got to be so proficient with watercolor? Because I think of it as being a medium that is extremely difficult to control. It is. And when you're working specifically on you know, this kind of paper, which is very absorbent, and yet, okay, he did draw, but he was so, he must have, I don't know, he must have just maybe through practice or what was it? How did you get there? Uh, you know, Al was a worker. Uh, and, you know, everything would be like, uh, and, and the building metaphor is, is kind of a good one because, I mean, he worked like a construction worker. Uh, really, I mean, you know, he would just work and work and work and work until he got what he wanted. And I, th I think he just, uh, I mean, I didn't see the very early things. Um, I think he just got better at it. Would he work on individual works or groups together or? Um, you know, I, m mainly he would finish something before he started something else. But sometimes I would see things that were, you know, there might be two or something in progress. But 
I think mainly he, you know, finished one and then did another. Although, you know, he probably had the idea already for the next one. He might have done these dreaming things thinking, thinking oh, well, I, that, that interesting. I want to do that. that. And would he go around? Do you, I mean, would he draw? Um, what, would he go to churches, say, and, and draw, or would he, or did he just work in the studio? All the no, time? no, he worked in the studio. But he looked at everything. He looked at absolutely everything. And uh, as I say, you know, you're surrounded by the Renaissance and Baroque. You're surrounded by the greatest art in the world, and that's what you're looking at. And that's you know what he was aiming at. In other words, he was aiming very high. Um, I don't know that any modern artist could be as good as you know. Michelangelo, Raphael, Pontormo, but uh, he, he felt that, you know, you should aim high. He, did, he didn't want to have this kind of, you know, low-level uh, ambition of, well, let's, uh, you know, let's make a hundred of them in a series and get them out to the, you know, the market. I mean, I think, you know, uh, he really had no interest in the art market. And, uh, I mean, Dorsey knows because she was his dealer long, long ago. But, um, you know, Al was a very difficult artist to represent because he was not going to make any compromises. And these wall-sized paintings that he produced, I once had an argument with him. I said, Al, I said, how are you going to get these into the gallery? He said, it's not my problem. I said, <laughs> he was showing with Andre Emmerich then, and, and Dorsey was the director of the gallery. And I said, but, but where, he said, they have to find a place to show them. I mean, they could not be absorbed by the market, although some of them, at a time when we had that program, you know, uh, with the GSA and the government was buying some things for public art, some of the things were placed. Some of the great big paintings were placed. Where are they now? There's a 180 foot black and white painting in Philadelphia. There's a 90 foot black and white painting uh, in Albany. Yeah, the Albany Mall one's great. And. Um, but are there others that we have? There, there are others. There's one in Akron, Ohio. There was one in Albany. Dallas. What's that? Albany. Yeah, we, we said the Albany. Albany. Yeah. yeah. But that was all Nelson Rockefeller. Right. I mean, if you have an enlightened patron, and he's got a lot of money, and he's the governor of New York, he can say, oh, okay, I want this in the mall. I want the, the best guys. They can do it as big as they want. And uh, the things that were done uh, at the Albany Mall, not all of them, but a number were, were very ambitious works. Yeah. Were, were those also hotels? No, no, no. They're fresco. No, no, they're not fresco either. They're acrylic. <laughs> I think one of the most perverse things I ever saw Al doing was, uh, you know, he would paint many, many, many layers of, of uh, you know, on these huge ones they call the alphabet ones, and then he would take a a sander. I, he may have even started with sandpaper. I don't know, but he he would take it, an enormous amount of time to sand the surfaces down so that you couldn't possibly see a brush stroke. He used more sander. Yeah. But it was, you would walk in there and you'd think, this, this guy's completely crackers. Why is he painting, you know, 50 layers of opaque paint and then he's using a floor sander to sand it down so that you can't see anything but a, a, a surface uh, that would be pure. But if you look at these paintings, you can't see the brush strokes either. So that idea that, you know, the artist was kind of anonymous, it wasn't expressionist. You didn't, you didn't see the stroke, you didn't see the hand. Uh, it was more mental. Um, and he wasn't a conceptual artist in the way that people think about it now, but he was a conceptual artist in the way that Cezanne was a conceptual artist. I guess that's, yeah. So he was really, he was really reacting to, to the expressionist, the, 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 the hand and... Uh... Well, I think, you know, the whole second generation of the New York School, who I think are uh, very underestimated, there were, there, there were some great, great painters. They, they were really good. Um, I mean, they didn't want to keep doing the same stuff. They wanted uh, to, to innovate uh, themselves, and, um, and a number of them did. Although most of them did keep the, the stroke, the, the visible stroke, the hand stroke, most of them. Yeah. Except for the stained color field painters. And uh, I mean, I think uh, you have to think of Al in this kind of dialogue uh, with those, um, Clem, the, the Clem group, because they were also about effacing the hand and luminosity and, and issues of that nature. Um, but, but his, uh, and they were all over here doing their group thing, and he was over here doing his thing all by himself. 
he didn't really... He was a non-group person. He was a, truly a non-group But person. did he have dialogues with any of his contemporaries or...? Well, you know, he taught for a long time. Yes. And he invented a method. Uh, uh, his students were people like Richard Serra and Bryce Martin and Judy Pfaff and Nancy Graves and, I mean, people. Um, but he invented a, a method of teaching, which was a critical, it was like a Socratic me you know, method. I mean, that you'd have to defend your work and then Al would attack it. Uh, and then he was always in dialogue, but not, I would, first of all, he was too smart. I mean, a lot of these uh, artists were not, you know, intellectuals, and Al was an intellectual. So there weren't that many people that you could actually have a good fight with. I don't know, Irving, I don't know if you agree with me. Well, one saving grace was no matter how you battled one day, the next time you met was completely forgotten. Just walled over again, you began Anew. Oh, yeah, there was, there was always a, a new battle. There was always a new battle to have. Ronnie Bladen, right, who uh, is a, a considerable and very interesting sculptor. Yeah, yeah, he did. Who, who else were his uh, friends? I don't know. Who were his closest? Those two. Sure. Who? Sure. George Sugar. Sure. Yeah. Bladen were his closest friends. And their sculptors. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's significant in any way? I mean, the sculptural. Do you, I mean, do you see anything an engagement with sculpture? Well, I, there's stuff? this whole issue of perspective. Once you're talking yeah. about perspective, you're talking about the third dimension. But uh, you know, these things don't. They don't give you a sense of the solid form of a three-dimensional form. So, um, no, Al certainly never wanted to be a sculptor. Uh, but I think he wanted uh, his forms to have a certain kind of weight, and also. It was the kind of people uh, that Sugarman and Bladen were. I mean, they, they were also kind of marginal to the, whatever the joining up with the group was. Yeah. But he did have a lot of discussions with his own students. I know that. Hmm. Did he like teaching? Hmm? Did he enjoy teaching? Was he? I think he really did. Yeah, I think he really liked the, the dialogue. I think that's what he enjoyed. And he gave a lot to these people. Uh, and his students were the best artists of, you know, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Um, and he, he created a, a, another um, important generation of students up at Yale. It's an interesting paradox, though, to, to, to be teaching and to be engaged then with younger people and what's going on, and yet also to, to withdraw and say you're going to do you know, your own thing and have nothing to do with, say, the... I think he was much more interested in what the younger people were talking about and thinking about. I mean, I know he invited Frank Stella up to Yale a number of times. Um, and I know that Stella liked his paintings a lot. And I think Al liked Stella's paintings. I think that he was uh, you know, more progressive and more forward looking in many ways. And so the problems, uh, let's say, that Richard Serra is going to deal with, they were more interesting to him than what Ken Nolan was doing. He would meet students after class. They would go to the local bar, and he would keep them there till two, three in the morning till they closed the bar down. Nice. And it was straight discourse, straight argument. <laughs> and if the student really could take that kind of pressure, yeah. verbal pressure, you could learn a hell of a lot in those sessions. But for him, it was kind of like exercise. I mean, he wanted to talk to these people with new ideas. Plus, that generation. They were intellectuals, much more so than the first generation of, of the abstract expressionists. Sure, you had a few intellectuals, like you know Barney Newman was a yeah. major intellectual, but in general, not. Yeah. Uh, and, and Al never went; didn't have a formal education. You know, he was uh, educated as an artist, didn't go to college, uh, and uh, that was true of uh, uh, well, Rauschenberg went to Black Mountain, but um, essentially, you know, those guys. Uh, they came in at the tail end of World War II. They got the GI Bill, which is why they could go to school. A lot of them went to the Art Students League, then they went to Paris, and you know Jack Youngerman and uh, Kelly, all those people. They're in Paris, uh, and they're they're seeing some really really good stuff. And then they come back here, and the first generation did not go to Europe because it was the war, and they couldn't go. Yeah. Was there an argument that he re liked to return to, or that he that he Fastened on. I don't know. I mean, uh, and anything could be an argument for Al to, to fasten on, including dinner. Uh, uh, it just, you know, it just could be anything. Um, 
No, he, and, and he also had a good sense of humor. I mean, he was really quite, I thought, amusing. But he, he liked the intellectual combat, you know. Uh, he, he really enjoyed this kind of um, the dialogue with people who could understand what he was talking about. Uh, and, the, and his own students were probably better th at that than his contemporaries. So the paintings are, are very th thought through. It's a, he was an intellectual. He thought. I mean, that's what he did. He thought, he thought about things all the time. Uh, and uh, in, in that sense, I mean, there's a very large intellectual, quote, conceptual, which I mean in the sense of mental or imaginative content to these paintings. They certainly seem that way. But some people can, you know, are purely intuitive and even uh, in their work and others, and, 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 then, and then as soon as they shut up the studio, they'll read or whatever. And others uh, they, are, you know, they, they go to... Uh, cocktail parties, they get dressed up, I don't know what they do. Um, <laughs> they go to dances at PS1, I don't know. You know, it's all so alien to me and, and to somebody like Al, it's just like not what we did. Um, you know, we would have discussions about uh, really aesthetic issues. Um, and I mean, they, they would be, you know, quite, uh, people would take a position and, I mean, and also, I mean, Greenberg uh, was an intellectual and you, you could fight with, uh, with Greenberg. I don't know, I never saw Greenberg and Al together Together, but uh, I, I, I did hear uh, Clem on many occasions denounce Al. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Al was uh, he was the enemy, you know. And so uh, Greenberg, I think he had a kind of respect for it because how could you not? But then again, he really didn't like Al. Would, what was his main complaint about him, though? I mean, was, uh, technically, or he just wasn't with the program. I mean, he wouldn't say that right, exactly, so. but he wasn't a stained color field painter, and that was, you know post-painterly abstraction. And in a weird way, you know, Al was doing post-painterly abstraction in the sense that there's no visible brush strokes. But then he's layering on this paint and then he's sanding it down so that it has this kind of solidity, you know, it has body. Uh, it's not uh, just floating color. Um, so uh, it, it's just, you know, it's a, it, it's a degree of complexity. For example, if you think about what people are doing today, if you can bear to do it, um, it's so shallow. I mean, if you put up, uh, you know, the kind of abstract um, geometric whatever painting that's going on today, and you put it up next to these paintings, and you say, eh, you know, it's just it's 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 formulaic. See, Al had no strategy. He had no formula. Each one of these paintings it was for him an individual problem to resolve, and that is not the way uh, the younger generation of people. Uh, coming out of the art schools, they're thinking, what's my strategy? How do I get into the market? Uh, how am I going to brand myself? I mean, that, you know, it's a, it's a completely different way of, of thinking. No doubt. Maybe let's leave it there. <laughs> I think it's, uh, <laughs> thank you.